Hi, it's Jill Schlesinger, and on this episode, we're talking about how you can get to the 0% tax bracket. The real question, I think, is for 75 million baby boomers who have a choice of either paying taxes today on their retirement savings or postponing the payment of those taxes till much further down the road, that they are going to save massive amounts of money by taking advantage of this tax sale. And if they let even a year go by where they don't strongly consider shifting money to tax-free investments like Roth IRAs, they're missing an opportunity. And that opportunity will never, ever come back. Welcome to the Better Off Podcast. We're sponsored by Betterment, the largest independent online financial advisor. Well, we've been talking uh, over the last few weeks about the fact the year's coming to a close and some of the important things that you need to think about with regard to your money. Just in time, we are squeezing in one last interview with somebody who's really passionate about where we are in the tax cycle. His name is David McKnight. He's written a book called The Power of Zero, How to Get to the Zero Percent Tax Bracket and Transform Your Retirement. I think this is really important because with tax laws changing, you need to understand what are the opportunities that exist. So here's our interview with David McKnight. You're listening to Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. David McKnight, welcome to the program. How are you? Great. Thanks for having me. We start the show with a very important question. You ready? I'm ready. Best financial decision that you've ever made? Uh, I think the best financial decision I ever made was to, and this sort of plays into my book, but to acknowledge uh, that I think the tax rates in the future are likely to be dramatically higher than they are today. So to forego the tax deductions of 401ks and IRAs pay the tax today so that when I retire and when I believe tax rates will likely be dramatically higher than they are today, I'll be able to take the money out tax free. All right. Tell us a little bit about yourself. You are an author of this book, The Power of Zero, which is revised and updated to reflect the new 2018 tax law. But who are you? How, How did you come into my universe? I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a father of seven. Okay, what? so that's <laughs> hold on. Hold the hold the phone, right? Seven. Yeah, I've got seven children. Six and five and four wasn't enough. No, no, no. What we you, kept what you, pressing onward here. So really, so we got the youngest is three, go yeah. all the way up to seventeen as of uh, two days ago. So and. We crank them out like an assembly line about every wow. two years. Yeah. Yeah. Are you done? We're done. We're my wife's forty-seven, so I, th- I think we. Uh, my wife tells me repeatedly our family is complete. So. So you're a dad of many. You are married. Uh, you went to Brigham Young University. Like, what did you do after you graduated from college? I've basically been in the financial services industry since day one. I've never known anything other than the financial services industry. What did you do when you first graduated from college? Uh, I actually got hired by MetLife Financial Services right, really? out, right out of you college. You were schlepping yeah, uh, insurance yeah, policies? Yeah, I was. Right How out was of that? Gate. It was tough going. I mean, it's tough. I mean, 90% of the people don't survive the first two years. So if you can make it through that gauntlet, it's uh, an accomplishment. How long did you stay at MetLife? I was with MetLife for two years. I was with uh, John Hancock for two years. And then I became an independent financial advisor in about 2001. So and, I've been doing I, that for about 17 years. And you're still doing that? Still doing that. And you do that in, like, what's your approach? How Are you, like, a holistic guy? Do you like to just do retirement? What's What's your, like, game here? Uh, we deal primarily with uh, retirees and pre-retirees, ages 50 to 65, people that still have control o- over the outcome, mm-hmm. uh, people that still feel like they're in a position to and – and we really do have a, a focus on the tax uh, outlook, um, how to accumulate – mathematically the right amount of dollars in the right types of accounts so that you can maximize the amount of dollars you can take out in retirement. You speak a lot. You've written this book. Do you have other advisors in your practice? Yeah, we've got about 160 advisors across the country. What? <laughs> Dude, are you kidding me? That's huge. Well, so the book, the book I, I, I wrote the, I actually self-published the book four years ago. Right. Um, threw it out on Amazon, crossed my fingers. Right. And to my utter disbelief, people started to buy the book. And uh, it sold about 150,000 copies over the course of four years. And um, it sort of 
created this following, this movement. And so I built a marketing program around the concepts in the book uh-huh. and it attracted a lot of financial advisors. So we have financial advisors actually teaching courses on this stuff in colleges to pre-retirees all across the uh, all across the country. That's probably the biggest part of what I do um, and how I feel like I'm making the most impact. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, 160 advisors doing that. Let's get to the book, which is called The Power of Zero. Um, the forward is written by a friend of the show, Ed Slot. Ed Slot. <laughs> and so I'm just going to read the first... The, the first sentence of his forward, taxes will be increasing. This book is a wake up call to reality. Can you describe what the current tax environment is now that the 2018 Tax Act has gone through. What, how would you describe this current rate, tax rate environment? Well, Ed and I have both described it very similarly, which is that there's a tax sale. Uh, taxes, you know, you're going to have to pay taxes sooner or later. You either have to pay it now or you got to pay it later. Uh, taxes just went on sale. You know, I used to tell people that we believe that tax rates somewhere in the distant unknowable future will likely go up, mm-hmm. uh, maybe 10 years from now. Uh, that's what the experts believe. Um, but now with the tax cuts, they have a, a sunset provision. We now know the year and the day when they're going to go back up again, and that's January 1st, 2026. What about this notion that once you have a tax cut, it is hard to sunset that tax cut, that it will somehow get put into permanent law? How do you respond to that as a as a counter to your argument. It takes an act of Congress to prevent that sunset from happening. So um, some people believe that it, you know, that provision could even be voted out of existence before 2026. But here's what has to happen. You have to have the same party controlling the House, the Senate and the presidency. I don't know if that can happen. It, It takes an alignment of the stars to make this thing go away. So we're telling our clients that you have eight years every year that goes by where you fail to take advantage of historically low tax rates is potentially a year on the back end Mm. where you could have to pay the highest taxes you'll see in your lifetime. And as you note, one of uh, the great stats is essentially roughly three quarters of every tax dollar, 76 cents of every tax dollar that the U.S. brings in is spent on four items, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and the interest on the national debt. So part of your thesis is not just that this is going to sunset, but that there will be a need to raise more dollars for the government to pay out promised benefits. So um, we've actually been filming the movie version of this book over the course of the last six months. We've interviewed all of, you know, Ed Slott, David Walker, former Comptroller General. We we even interviewed a guy named George Schultz. You may have heard of him, former Secretary of State. He's still alive. He's 98 years old. Oh, my God. We interviewed you. He's actually one of the brightest economists on the planet. He said, look, the real gusher here is Medicare. Right. We're going to have to keep borrowing money to pay for Medicare. And then as interest rates rise... The cost of servicing all that debt, he says, is going to squeeze out all of the other items in the budget, you know, creating this real fiscal crisis. He says, we are already at the crisis point. Really? Yeah. He says, we're already there. When you talk about this, one of the things you put, I I just highlighted this, that you say, um, with the exception of two years in the early 90s, let's put that aside. We haven't had tax rates this low in 88 zero years. And you told me a funny story that when you walked in, that when you will say to a client, you know, who complains about taxes, you know, how do you think your tax rate compares now to the past? What do they usually say? They always say it's as bad as it's ever been. And the truth is taxes today, and nobody likes paying taxes, so we acknowledge that. But taxes today are as low as we've ever seen them. Now, you could make the case that the Bush tax cuts the highest marginal tax rate was only 35, but you can't pay attention just to the number. You have to pay attention to the income parameters that govern those tax brackets. And to have a 22% tax bracket that starts at 77 and change and goes all the way up to 165, and then for 2% more, you can go all the way up to 315. Last year, to, to be able to have $315,000 of income where you could either earn it or convert it to Roth IRAs, that would have put you in the 33% tax bracket. Even those top tax brackets... down to 37, but also that the lower rate is applying to all that income up to that level. Right. It's pretty amazing, right? Yeah, and you know, I don't think there's enough... Uh, um, attention being paid to this. I mean, when you see the the media, they're saying, okay, how does this affect Joe mainstream America, right? Uh, How much can he save in his check? How many loaves of bread can he buy with that savings? But the real question, I think, is for 75 million baby boomers who have a choice of either paying taxes today on their retirement savings or postponing the payment of those taxes till much further down the road, that they are going to save massive amounts of money by taking advantage of this tax sale. And if they let even a year go by where they don't strongly consider shifting money to tax-free investments like Roth IRAs, that 
they're missing an opportunity. And that opportunity will never, ever come back. Well, let's give you a scenario. So I have a traditional 401k. Okay. I'm putting 18.5 plus my six for my catch up. I'm 60 years old. Should I actually make a choice to stop contributing to that tax deferred account and instead pay the tax due and invest in a taxable account? You could. I mean, in theory, if, you're, uh, if your income is low enough, whatever's in your taxable bucket is actually tax-free. You don't pay capital gains on that. So that's an, that's an important consideration. All right. Let me, give you a more, let me give you more information. Okay. I'm a married couple. I work. My husband's at home. I make 200 grand a year. 200 grand a year. Okay. So you've been phased out of the Roth IRA contributions. Exactly. Okay. Now what do I do? So and we're and are we putting the backdoor Roth IRA on the table or off the table? On the table. Okay, so the, so we could do a, a backdoor Roth IRA, so long as you don't have a lot of money sitting in other IRAs, because that makes it problematic. So explain, in easy to understand terms, we've had Slot do this, but let's see if you're better at it. <laughs> I don't think explain I am. <laughs> the backdoor Roth and why having other existing IRA accounts could complicate it. Yeah. So what what the IRS says is that if you uh, make too much money, you can actually put after-tax dollars into an IRA. Um, and then in the very same breath, you can convert it to a Roth IRA. Because you used after-tax dollars to begin with, you could then convert it to a Roth IRA. But the IRS says that if you have a bunch of money in your, um, in your other IRAs, you have to take whatever the percentage of that IRA is relative to the IRA that you're converting relative to all your other IRAs, whatever, and then subtract it from one. And then that is the portion of tax you would have to pay on that conversion. So it feels like a double tax. You you used after-tax dollars, and then you paid the, the tax on the conversion anyway. Um, I don't know if that's a very articulate way of saying it, but um, the point is, if you have money in other IRAs, it may not be that great an idea to do the backdoor Roth IRA. This is Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. We'll get back to our interview with David McKnight in just a second. You know, I think that the most insane mistake that we make is that we concentrate so much on whether we're getting 6% return, 7% return, instead of really focusing on the whole picture. And that's why I think it's so important to really think about your tax situation in addition to everything else. You know, the average schlub out there, what do they do? Oh, I made 10%, I made 6%. That's what they concentrate on. But you're not average. So why settle for the same old average investing? Now there is a smarter way to manage your money, Betterment. They use cutting edge technology to build personalized portfolios and help you make more from your investments. Plan for retirement. Reach your financial goals. Make the most of your money. Don't settle for average investing. Demand better. Better Off listeners can get up to one year managed free by visiting Betterment.com slash Better Off. That's Betterment.com slash Better Off. Now let's get back to our interview with David McKnight. So now let's just presume uh, I've worked in three different jobs. I've got rollover IRAs. And you know what, David? I cannot do the backdoor Roth because I can't deal with this, all these other IRAs. Now, what should I do? Uh, there are other options. Okay, some people like to call it the rich man's Roth, um, which is what I call the life insurance retirement plan, which is in my book, um, which is basically saying you do the opposite of what most people do when it comes to life insurance. Most people, when it comes to life insurance, they buy as much uh, death benefit as they can for as little money as possible. Mm -hmm. um, Ed Slot talks about this a lot. You buy as little insurance as the IRS requires of you. You stuff as much money into it as the IRS allows in an attempt to mimic a lot of the tax-free benefits of the Roth IRA. There are no limits on how much you put in. Uh, so, th so that's another way. It's not for everybody. There are some long-term care benefits associated with it that make it very attractive for baby boomers who are retiring. Most baby boomers right now are dealing with a parent who's going through a long-term care event. And they're yeah. saying, how am I going to deal with this? You hope you die early. Uh, yeah. People Please, are, God. And people aren't opposed to paying for long-term. People aren't opposed to having long-term care insurance. They're just opposed to paying for it. Um, <laughs> hey, you know what? I'd love long-term <laughs> care insurance if you paid for that's it. That's right. For me. That's right. That's right. So if you could find a way to get long-term care coverage without feeling like you're paying for it. What, what, what people struggle with with a traditional long-term care insurance is you're paying for something you hope you never use. Yeah, but get over it, dude. Because you know what? I pay for uh, auto insurance 
once every year, and I hope I never use it. I know, I know. So. This is, you know, if your auto insurance costs you eight grand a year and had the ability to go up at a, you know, on a whim, that's the part of it that I think is ridiculous. That, that the, the like, right? premium increases. I'm not a huge fan of the life insurance because I feel like you got to pay for all these fees, and there's too many squirrely insurance agents who sell you crap you don't need. Right. So that makes me nervous. Taxable, tax deferred, tax free. Right. Three buckets. Three buckets. Right. Taxable, plain old investment account, tax deferred, these 401k, 403b, IRA, tax free, Roth. Roth 401k, Roth IRA, Roth conversion. Um, You can even make your 401k tax free if you only take out up to your standard deduction, which is $24,000 in today's dollars. So to me, the best investment I talk about in the whole book Mm. is money that's still in your tax deferred bucket, like your IRA or 401k. But if you can make that balance low enough... When the IRS forces you to take the money out at age 70 and a half, make that balance low enough so that your RMDs are equal to or less than your standard deduction. Oh, that's really brilliant. So here's the thing. What's the holy grail of financial planning? Finding an investment that gives you a deduction on the front end. It grows tax deferred. You take it out tax free. Part of the problem is if you have an IRA or 401k that's so big that your required minimum distributions are dramatically higher than 24000 or the inflation-adjusted equivalent, um, then you're going to be on the IRS's radar. You're going to be in a tax bracket, and it's not going to be zero. Mm -hmm. And the reason I uh, it's called the power of zero is because, you know, David Walker, former Comptroller General of the federal government in 2010, he wrote an op-ed on CNN. He says, tax rates are going to have to double to keep our country solvent. So Mm -hmm. if that prophecy came true, okay... Um, the best, the very best tax bracket to be in is the 0% tax bracket. Yes, it's our favorite. Why? Because if tax rates double, two times zero is still zero, right? I can do that math. <laughs> I don't even need to take that CFP exam to do That's it. That's right. What is it that you think people just don't understand right now? What is it that, is it that tax rates really are low and they're concentrating on the wrong thing? Are they investing in the wrong way? How do you see this among your clients and the people that you encounter just in all these speaking engagements? So So I address a lot of people across the country and I ask them, what do you think, where do you think tax rates are headed in the next 10 years? And they all say they're going up. So they all recognize that tax rates are going up. And they even I even say, tell me why. And they say, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, interest on the debt. So they know why. So I say, why are we still putting money hand over fist into 401ks and IRAs? Mm. And that's where, I mean, put it this way, uh, Jill, there are 20, $21 trillion in the cumulative IRAs and 401ks across America. There's $800 billion in Roth IRAs. Mm. That's a 20 to 1 ratio, 21 to 1 ratio. Um, why, if we all believe in our heart of hearts, we sort of read the handwriting on the wall, why do, if we believe that tax rates are likely to be higher in the future than they are today, why do we forego these tax-free alternatives? Because we're addicted to the tax deduction, right? We perceive that one of the great values of these retirement accounts is to get a tax deduction. Well, guess what? The true purpose of a retirement account is not to get a tax deduction. It's to maximize cash flow at a period in your life when you can least afford to pay the taxes. Mm. That's the real value of a retirement account. So so even if people believe that they're going to be in a higher tax bracket in retirement, and that's something I, I, I think I debunk in the book, um, they're still putting money into 401ks and IRAs. And sometimes it's just a reflexive sort of activity. Let's presume that your tax rate is going to rise in the future, but you work in a place where you pretty much only have this thing called a 401k, right? Is there something that you should be, like if we had somebody today who called up and said, I'm 65, I'm retiring next year. I've got a million dollars in my 401k, right? And uh, I want to start paying the tax on it sooner rather than later. Would it be prudent for that person to say over the next now six years where tax rates are low, I'll just take the money out little by little and and bite the bullet and pay the tax due? Yeah. And it depends on where what their tax rate is now. It really depends. I don't think I I would make any sweeping recommendations as far as that goes. What Mm -hmm. I would tell people is that we've got an eight-year tax sale. If you feel like your tax rate is going to be higher, uh, lower today than it is in the future, let's stretch that tax liability out over eight years. Mm -hmm. And this is what I tell people. You want to shift the money quickly enough that you get all the heavy lifting done before the tax freight train hits. Okay? Right. But you want to do it slowly enough that you don't rise into a tax bracket that makes you feel uncomfortable. We had an interesting call from somebody who uh, was self-employed 
and could really manage his cash flow in terms of like taking on a project, not taking on a project. And the question was kind of cool. It was like, hey, does it make sense to kind of artificially keep my income down for a few years here, right? And I can't save as much, but I could start converting more and more of my money at lower rates. Do you give up that current cash flow and potential savings to pay the tax that's due? What do you think? If you find yourself in a position where you can manipulate revenue or what have you and be, uh, that's great. I wonder what the guy's living on in the meantime. Um, But if he can find a way to make all that work, you know, at the very least, he should be maxing out his 10 and his 12% tax bracket goes all the way up to 77.4. So if he's got no income, why not max out that 12% tax bracket each and every year? Right. It's another big leap to go from 12 to 22. Right. Um, there's nothing in between, right? No, there's it's, nothing it's in between. It's a funny thing, it's right? It's a funny thing, but I think that the IRS somehow has this thing wired. Um, but, but the other thing that people got to recognize is that you may not believe that your tax rates will double. I mean, I've interviewed all of the most important people in academia across the country, they believe tax rates could double. That seems, they, they're all looking at the data and they all seem to be singing the same song on that. You may not think that tax rates will double. However, guess what? If you have all your monies in 401ks and IRAs and your wife dies mm-hmm. or your husband dies, mm-hmm. guess what happens to your tax bracket? You go from being married, filing jointly yeah. to single, yes. your tax bracket doubles. Pops. Right. So it would go from a 12% to a 22 or a 24. So guess what? Even though you didn't believe anything I was telling you, your spouse died and now you're at double the tax rate. So wow. your tax rates are going to double no matter what, Can unless I... you unless you and your spouse die on the same day. All right. Now let's do a little politics. Were these tax cuts irresponsible given what you've just told us? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, my clients will take advantage of these tax cuts all day long. Of course. What are you, an idiot? Right. you got to give what's you, given to you. You buy the jeans when they're on sale. Right. You don't wait till the sale's over. But it costs a trillion and a half dollars to fund the tax cut. And you know, Ben Bernanke says it'll be great for productivity, but they're not going to pay for themselves. So all we really did was kick the can a little further down the road. We, we tacked an additional one and a half trillion dollars onto the debt and there is no place. Do you know that we're the only country in the world who, during this economic boom, is not getting their fiscal house in order? Every other country in the world's paying down their debt, and we're just continuing to throw stuff on the credit card. It's and- a little scary. Because what happens for someone like you or me, who is in the, or I used to be in the business of giving advice, you would always say to your clients, hey, oh, you got a big year? You made a bonus? Put, scroll some of that away. Clean right. some of this stuff up, right? Right. right. Hmm. We're not doing it. David McKnight, author speaker. The book is called The Power of Zero. We asked you at the beginning of the program, your best financial decision. What's your worst? And don't tell me it was the sixth and seventh kids because you (laughs) cannot put that down there. Uh, That's a really good question. My worst financial decision was to buy a car and move to Puerto Rico and sell it a year later. Ooh. So and it was a nice car. It was a it was an expensive car, and I really took a bath on it. So what kind of car? It was a BMW X5. Do not get a BMW X5 and plan on escaping with your financial with your savings account intact if you're planning on selling it a year later. Also, don't really buy a car that's really expensive anyway because it's buy a it used. it's a lousy investment. It's a lousy investment. David McKnight, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Joe. You're listening to Better Off with Jill Schlesinger. After our interview segment, we do talk to you and we have our listener question of the week. If you've got a question that's been poking around inside of you and it's financially related, maybe it's even a work question. Maybe it's a benefits question. Maybe it's a maybe it's a new job offer. Who knows? All you have to do is send us an email, askjill at jillonmoney.com. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. That's what Robert did. He is calling from Atlanta. Thank you for taking my call, Jill. It's a privilege to talk to you. Oh, aren't you sweet? It's my privilege to help you out. What can I do for you? Well, uh, I'm a civil servant, been in for 32 years, and been um, invested in TSP since it started in 1987, and most of the time just plodding along, but we maxed out our contributions all the way. And um, many times it didn't do anything, so I didn't pay much attention to it, never rebalanced anything like that. Now I'm probably about two years away from retirement, and I'm going, I need to to start thinking about rebalancing, and, and, uh, and I have. I started moving money to the safer G funds and, and F funds. 
and I'm just, uh, am I going to miss growth? Am I doing the right thing? Should I do it faster or should I do it slower? <laughs> so let's let's go backwards a second, though. Okay. So you're a couple of years away from retirement. So how old are you? Uh, I'm just 60. Okay. And are you single or coupled? Uh, married, no children. Okay. Does your uh, spouse work? No, she doesn't. Okay. And how much money is in that TSP right now? Um, $1,051,000. i am going to call it a million. That's darn good. Good work, man. Good work. <laughs> okay. Now, you're also entitled to a pension, I bet, right? Yes, I am. Tell me what that pension looks like in two years when you retire. Uh, probably before taxes, about 41000 a year. Okay. And... How does that jibe with what you spend? Um, well, after tax and all, that would probably take care of all of our um, our day-to-day needs. So you can live on this. Your pension is sweet, no problem, all good, right? Right. Fantastic. Are you entitled to Social Security, or do you get? Or are you not entitled to it? Well, I'm a first employee, so I've been contributing to Social Security. Okay. And then in my previous jobs, I was contributing as well. Okay. And so when you get to your full retirement age, which is probably 65, 6, 66 maybe? Um, uh, 66 and a half. Okay. What would your Social Security benefit be at that point? I think it'll be probably around 2600 a month. Oh, my God. That's fantastic. Okay. And um, house paid for? Uh, no, we just moved back to the United States, so we bought a house about 18 months ago. So Ooh. we're just getting started. Okay. How much did you pay for the house? Uh, 280 Mm-hmm. And what's the outstanding mortgage amount? 217 Okay. Uh, the mortgage rate? 3.5. Very good. Was that at 30? Or a- uh, yes, okay. 30 a year. Okay. I mean, it's fine for you to have some income, uh, I mean, to have the mortgage because you do have income and you will have income. And I presume the game plan is you retire in a couple of years, you live off your Social Security, you've got this nice fund that's rocking and rolling, but you don't need to, it doesn't sound like you need to tap the TSA. Do you have any non-retirement assets set aside for perhaps, you know, if you needed some money and you didn't want to pay tax on it? Uh, Well, we have... um substantial amount of cash uh, in CDs and savings accounts. Like how much? Uh, 325. Gorgeous. Fantastic. Okay. So just give me the breakdown of the TSP right now. In the C fund, which is the stock fund, how much is there? Uh, In the C fund, it's uh, 588,000. Okay. And in the G fund, which is the fixed income? Uh, G fund is one hundred eighty nine thousand. Okay, and what else was in there? You got uh, one other. There's probably some other stuff floating. F around. fund, F fixed income, yep. uh, one hundred fifteen thousand, mm-hmm. uh, hundred thousand in the small cap, and fifty two thousand in the international stocks. I don't even think you need the, to like mess around with this so much more. I mean, you could. You want to be fifty fifty? Is that your goal? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of afraid that I'm going to break some golden eggs here if, I, <laughs> the, market, if the market goes down um, like it did the other day. Yeah, I mean, you can do it every month if you want. You can do it, you know, quarterly if you want. I, I wouldn't go nuts. Look, <laughs> the, and here's why. So, you know, you've got a chunk of money that is invested in the C and the small cap. Those, like the C, the small cap, and the international, that's where your risk lies, right? On the other hand... You probably are not going to touch this money. This is not two-year money. My guess is you're not touching this money for a long time. I'm not even sure you ever have to touch this money. <laughs> I mean, really. I, so so this, if you're just saying to me, I want to sleep at night, then you can just go straight ahead and say, I'm going to put 50% in the F and the G and split the rest between the, the between the C and the small cap and the international and just go to sleep at night. Just do it now. Who cares? Because what's the downside of doing it now? The downside of doing it now is that you're wrong and the market soars. Who cares? It doesn't matter. You're in such good shape. There is absolutely nothing, nothing for you to worry about. You would, This would be sleep at night, peaceful decision making. Don't look back. Don't roll this over to anything because these are cheap and really good funds. 
And if you really don't like want to take the ride for, you know, these these years where you're entering as you approach retirement, go to 5050, do it right away and don't look back. Well, that's it. That's the show. Thanks to David McKnight and our caller, Robert. We drop new episodes every Tuesday and Thursday. If you'd like to get on the air with us, just shoot us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Talercio is our executive producer. We are distributed by Cadence 13 and we're sponsored by Betterment. See you next week.